Hello, it's Felix, it's the Rep, Rugby's Economic Podcast. This is the show that looks at how money, power and politics have driven our game since William Webb Ellis picked up a ball and ran. This is the place where we focus less about what's happening on the pitch and more on the business of running a professional sport like rugby. Our aim is to shine the floodlights on the challenges rugby faces as a global sport, provide a view on what's being done about them and offer some suggestions on how they may be tackled. In the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the problems rugby faced when turning professional 25 years ago and how that shaped the never-ending northern-southern hemisphere seasons that merged and clashed into each other from year to year. This week, I'd like to pick up the conversation where we left it, this time diving off our feet and head first into the game's newest stakeholder, CVC. This will be our last episode before Christmas, so get your ice bath and shower over with and pull on that club jacket because there's a dress code as we're going full Christmas junket in this week's instalment of The Rep. Looking at the private equity sector as a whole, involvement in professional sports is not new, but it's certainly ramped up in the last decade. According to data researcher PitchBook, 7.8 billion euro was invested by private equity in sports across the US and Europe from the beginning of 2020 to the end of February this year. That's up from 5 billion in 2019. Most chalk this up to the dire straits many sports clubs have found themselves in in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. As we've highlighted on this show over the past few weeks, the over-reliance on fans at games has hit club coffers hard, forcing clubs across different sports to seek alternative revenues, like expanding to new audiences through the sale of broadcasting rights. Other reasons for the growth in these investments is driven by the expertise these organisations can bring to clubs and leagues in technology opening up new revenue streams such as OTT paid broadcasting and associated gated content. Many sports are trying to tap into these new streams and there's an imperative for them to get this right. The big players in this space include US firms KKR and technology investor Silver Lake Partners, as well as CVC who we've all come to know through their recent investments in rugby. They see the growing interest in wellness, improved health and maintaining an active lifestyle as an opportunity to make more money. This trend is fueling more interest in sports whether that be watching events live on TV or actually participating in them. In turn, this is driving up the value of sports-related assets who offer cash-generating, predictable and reoccurring revenues to investors. This is even more attractive because they often get media rights and potentially multiple sponsorships and global partnerships within these predictable reoccurring revenue streams. This can be forecasted with a high degree of confidence, making investments a safe bet. So with that in mind, let's look at CVC's foray into rugby. CVC first stepped on the rugby pitch in 2018 with an investment in Premiership Rugby. The deal worth £200 in return for a 27% shareholding was to be used for reinvesting into rugby to grow the sport at all levels to benefit the fans, the clubs and players. At the time, PRL Chief Ian Ritchie said the investment would not be used to increase player wages but to improve facilities at the club level. Fast forward to today and as we emerge from a global pandemic, the PRL have bigger concerns on their mind. The financial security of the premier clubs is at risk, so they have had to take steps towards ring-fencing England's top league to provide that security. This has been agreed with the RFU, who have a say here given the semi-professional and amateur clubs affected in the championship and below, and has come at a price. The usual horse trading over access to players between the RFU and the league has seen PRL agreed to end 2022-2023 season in May of that year to allow the England team more time to prepare ahead of Rugby World Cup a win of sorts for Eddie Jones' last chance at the Webb Ellis with England. In 2020, CBC continued its rugby spending spree by agreeing a €130 million Euro deal for 28% of Celtic Rugby DAC, the administrators of the Pro 14, with the remaining 72% staying in the hands of the unions. The key difference between this deal and the PRL one is that this was made with the unions, with the latter having been conducted with the owners of the individual clubs. A much harder deal to make as the unions have an obligation to grow the game in their respective nations and can't just pump the money back into the elite player level. Under the agreement, the Italian Rugby Federation will finally take a seat at the table and receive a portion of the investment having been involved in the league for over 10 years. The role CVC will play has become apparent as their first season at the table took off. They've decided to rip it up and start again. 
They've rebranded the Guinness Pro 14 to a yet sponsorless United Rugby Championship, or URC as it has become known. There's a fresh format with regional conferences, one of which hosting South Africa's top club sides, and European Cup promotion at stake. With a guarantee of a conference winner booking a European place, the league has a new dual battle constantly ongoing, one for regional dominance to secure that Champions Cup spot, and one for total domination of the league. The latter an important battle for the likes of Ireland's provinces who boast the best rivalries and the highest opportunity to send its four teams to Europe. One of the more welcome additions to the format is the new match schedule. The URC has been specifically designed to avoid conflict with the international game. This small innovation does two things. One, it ensures the clubs have access to their top players for every round, barring injury etc. And two, it increases the quality of the competition, making the new league much more attractive to prospective sponsors or broadcasters. This has come to fruition, but not as people might have thought. CVC have done deals with local free-to-air broadcasters in UK and Ireland, bringing live rugby back to millions of fans every week. In parallel, they've agreed a £55 million a year broadcasting deal with Supersport in South Africa, up from £25 million for the Pro 14 last year. And they've successfully launched their own OTT platform called URC TV which allows subscribers to purchase a season ticket for their favourite team or individual games and even a weekend pass to watch all the games from a particular weekend. Either way, there's plenty of options for fans to consume the new tournament, especially if away from home for any reason. I, for one, have been guilty many times of searching for a live stream on my phone and popping it up on a table at weddings and such, much to the annoyance of my wife, but now that process is much easier. One problem solved. Don't think the missus will be as easy a fix though. Hmm. So no more conflicts with the international game and the ability to stream from anywhere on any device ensuring you never miss a game. Solid improvements from what had been there before. But who's steering this ship? This is where CVC have come into their own and brought something other than money to the table. They have facilitated an introduction to rapper Jay-Z's entertainment company Rock Nation who are involved with the URC to drive marketing initiatives to broaden the league's appeal. Rock Nation has sought to sign up and manage some of the league's biggest players boasting World Cup winning Springbok captain Sio Khaleesi and other superstars like Saracen's Mara Watoje. Representing such talent has given them an insight into what their role could be in growing and modernising the game. In an interview, President of Rock Nation Sports Division Michael Yormack said, How do you make rugby cool? You have to build the story of these players off the field. A lot of these players' journeys are very impressive. Aside from showing us another side of these players, I have no doubt that Rock Nation's involvement will mean more for rugby in terms of live entertainment, really leaning on the entertainment side of sports entertainment. But this wouldn't be the first time we've seen this in rugby. Some of us will remember Max Gozini and his Stade Francais team of the early noughties. But for those who don't, this is an interesting yarn into a man who had a vision for rugby beyond its years. Max acquired Stade in 1992 but facing financial difficulties, he merged it with a Comité Athletique Saint-Germain, or CASG, in 1995, a team with money but lacking sporting pedigree. Bringing in Bernard Laporte, today's Vice President of World Rugby, they rapidly secured promotion to what is now the top 14 and had won the championship by 1998. A meteoric rise. To keep the winning ways, Stade Francais recruited superstars of the day, including Diego Dominguez, the late Christophe Dominici, Marc Vievermont, and the Bergamasco brothers from Italy, and the infamous Sergio Parise. But rugby on the pitch was only part of the story. The real innovation of Max Gazzini was the entertainment off the pitch. This started with involving some of the key players in a nude calendar, and culminated in cheerleaders and live music being played before games in the Parisian HQ. There would be Moulin Rouge-esque dancers delivering the ball to the pitch ahead of kickoff, and players would soon be wearing a variety of eye-catching shirts. Everything from brilliant pink adorned with flowers to random Andy Warhol inspired jerseys. It was about creating a show, a spectacle, and Max understood that for rugby to grow it needed to appeal to the modern Parisian in a city where soccer reigned supreme. Gazzini's legacy was cemented when he scheduled a home fixture in 2005 against Toulouse at the Stade de France. It was crazy to think he could fill France's national stadium considering Stade's home stadium, the Stade Jean Bouin, had less than 10,000 people at the time. But sure enough, the final attendance was 79,500, smashing the national attendance record for a league match in any sport by more than 20,000 fans. He achieved this by offering tickets as low as 5 and 10 euro. He understood that to grow the fan base, you needed to get them into the stadium and put on a show. Fast forward to today and we see the same trend emerging again from Paris. 
this time from 10 kilometers up the road across the River Seine in the La Défense business district. This is the home of Racing 92, owned by French billionaire Jackie Lorenzetti. Owing his fortune to his property management company, Lorenzetti was familiar with the Nanterre business district and couldn't pass up the opportunity to develop the now infamous La Défense Arena. Holding 32,000 fans on match day, it is a stadium like no other, literally. It's an indoor arena with seats on three sides, with the other end boasting a gigantic 60 metre screen. Any self-respecting rugby fan will have seen the likes of Simon Zebo and Finn Russell galloping up and down the pristine surface of the La Defense Arena by now. It's fantastic. On match days, the lights are dimmed and the music starts, followed by pyrotechnics and more music. It's a sensory overload. After the game, there's a DJ and dancing. It's like being in a nightclub, except there's a rugby pitch instead of a dance floor, and the Parisian crowd lap it up. This is what Laura Zeddy understands, like Max before him, and what Rock Nation will no doubt attempt to introduce wider in the sport. In what form? That remains to be seen. Back to CVC, where we have yet to touch their latest and probably most profound investment to date, and that's their purchase of a 14% stake in the Six Nations. For a price of £365 million, the home nations have been convinced to invite a seventh partner to the table. The new partnership will cover the men's, women's and under-20s tournaments, as well as the autumn internationals involving England, France, Ireland, Italy, Scotland and Wales. Importantly, the new agreement states that the unions will continue to have control over all sporting matters, while CVC will provide their expertise in commercial and broadcasting matters, with decisions on the latter requiring majority approval from the unions. With this mandate, one of the first decisions many thought CVC would make would be to move the Six Nations behind the paywall, securing a lucrative broadcasting deal. Just the opposite has occurred, with deals being struck both sides of the Irish Sea with broadcasters. In the UK, Channel 4 and ITV will share the rights to show the games, whilst in Ireland it will sit between RT and Virgin Media. These deals, rumoured to be in the region of £60 million a year between both, will see the Six Nations remain free to air for the foreseeable future. This is a great win for fans, especially those who only tune in once a year to watch the Six Nations. With the Autumn International window, the situation is much different. Now called the Autumn Series, the broadcasting rights have all but been sold off to Amazon for their Prime TV offering. Moving the series of hemispheric clashes between North and South out of the reach for many fans not willing to subscribe. Quick life hack here. Amazon offer a 30-day trial of Prime when you sign up so that any savvy punter could have made use of that during the month of November. Just saying. One would have to imagine that this is a short-term move as the commercial advantage would be to either sell the rights for the Autumn and Six Nations windows as a package to one broadcaster for megabucks ensuring exclusivity or getting access to the Summer International window, merging it with the Autumn and creating a new North-South competition, again selling the rights for megabucks to some bloodthirsty broadcaster. Along the same vein, there's been much talk about our South African friends joining the Six Nations competition much to the horror of traditional fans who believe the tournament should stay as it is. Ben Morrill, CEO of Six Nations Rugby, has said that he's very cautious about expanding the tournament and that the box are committed to the rugby championship for the foreseeable future anyway. For now, it seems like it'd be a cold day in Durban before this comes to fruition. An additional or integrated global competition is more likely. You know what time it is, it's Skip Pass, the part of the show where we sidestep our main topic and chance a dummy at something seemingly unrelated to come to some parallel point and try to be insightful. In reality, it's just a bit of a breeder for the pack who have to decide where to walk to for the eventual scrum from our knock-on. Let's take a look. This week, Skip Pass is going back to the All Blacks like in episode 4, this time talking about the groundbreaking deal they've made with Silver Lake, another US private equity firm. Like in the Northern Hemisphere, sports on the other side of the world are increasingly drawn to the marketing expertise offered by private equity, and of course the money. But in New Zealand, it's not just about buying a stake in the team, you're buying a stake in society, in the country. We need to remember that the All Blacks are what gave New Zealand its identity in its formative years. In the early 1900s, when touring teams went nearly undefeated through Britain, it stirred pride at home. Maori and Pacific Island players helped bridge racial divides, and the All Blacks today perform the Maori haka before every match. Even the All Blacks don't see themselves as owners of the jersey, but rather custodians of it, responsible for its history and its future legacy. It's not exactly something they can sell. The All Blacks belong to all New Zealanders. This is the ideological debate that has been playing out in New Zealand since the news of the potential investment from Silver Lake was mooted. But despite being one of the most successful teams in world sport, 
and certainly the most successful in world rugby. New Zealand rugby has posted losses in five of the past six years, showing how difficult it is to fund a championship team from a nation of just five million people at the bottom of the world. The NZRU, which supports rugby at every level around the country, typically only make a profit when there's a big international tournament like the World Cup every four years. The Players Association recognised the financial challenges and have suggested an alternative approach to take the All Blacks public. Their proposal was to sell up to 5% of the NZRU to New Zealanders through an IPO on the local stock exchange. It is thought that this could raise as much as 191 million Kiwi dollars. Similar tax have been used by the Green Bay Packers in the NFL and Manchester United in the English Premier League. But it was not to be. Silver Lake has valued the NZRU at 3.1 billion Kiwi dollars and have agreed to buy a 12.5 stake for just under $390 million. Defending the deal, the NZRU have said the money will be reinvested into the grassroots game, which is badly underfunded, to ensure the continued success of the national team. Research they carried out tells them that there are about 65 million avid fans around the world, another 300 million general fans, and then about 900 million people who just have an awareness of the All Blacks. The NZRU just don't have the right resources or proper skills to capitalise on this available market and monetize the opportunity as they are today. Sport is evolving away from the traditional funding model where a team secures sponsorship, sells broadcast rights and has no real relationship with the consumer. In the digital age, teams are increasingly turning to new forms of technology to help provide a richer, more personalised experience for fans at home and abroad. The Silver Lake deal will allow them to bring in the expertise alongside their new shirt sponsor in France to help grow that brand and expand it to new markets. As is the case with much of the rugby landscape, where New Zealand go, others will follow. And so it appears that the Australian Rugby Union are up next to take Shylock's ducats. Under the guidance of Hamish McLennan, the ARU have confirmed that they too will explore a sale of their business, up to 15%. Maybe, just maybe, shirt sponsor Cadbury will jump in on the action and turn the gold jersey purple once and for all. So what do we make of private equity's entry into the rugby landscape? It seems they'll be bringing more than just their wallet, facilitating introductions to specialist entertainment companies, securing more lucrative broadcasting deals, and even staying out of the running of the sport for the most part. This sounds almost too good to be true. And that's why Formula One can offer us a cautionary tale about what happens when you get into bed with private equity. Let's face some hard facts here. Their approach is simple. Buy a business, extract the maximum possible revenue from it, and sell it on for a further profit. According to CVC, this holding period typically takes up to 3 to 7 years. In the case of Formula 1, it was closer to 10, highlighting just how lucrative it was for them. If we start with TV rights, anyone familiar with the sport will know that Formula 1 almost went completely behind the paywall over that period. With the policy of selling to the highest bidder, irregardless of the impact on the sport, motor racing's popularity has been on a steady decline. Official figures from Formula 1 show television audiences fell below 400 million in 2016. That's one third less than where they were in 2008 when CVC came on the scene. Accelerated in 2012 when half of all live races disappeared from free-to-air television in the UK. If this were to happen in rugby, it would cause untold and potentially irreparable damage to the sport. Less people would see the game and children wouldn't be inspired to play it losing them to other sports, or worse, to other distractions away from sport altogether. The positive benefits rugby has on society would disappear. It is already hard enough in countries like Ireland where rugby is already fighting for mindshare against indigenous Gaelic sports and soccer without making it completely inaccessible. Another impact Formula 1 faced was the increase in tournament hosting fees and the scheduling of races outside of the sport's traditional stomping grounds in search of exotic new markets. In part, this was driven by wealthy states seeking to gain political capital and positive PR by securing a race for their country. But it came at the expense of race promoters. Famous tracks like Silverstone now face bankruptcy as a result. We don't face this challenge to the same degree in rugby, but it's something that rears its head when the World Cup bidding comes around. Here, World Rugby are a little better, typically trading hemisphere every second tournament whilst balancing an established location versus an expansion hopeful. The 2019 installment hosted by Japan has yet failed to truly grow the game there, but there's been a global pandemic since, so let's not be too harsh on our Japanese friends. What can be said, commercially, is that hosting the Rugby World Cup is both an expensive and lucrative business for all involved. Given that France will host 2023, it remains to be seen how World Rugby will judge the 2027 hopefuls. Will it return to the South and be hosted by Australia, 
or will it stay in the north and venture to new lands with both Russia and the USA bidding? Many believing that a US World Cup is the fix-all button for rugby, which will bring it to the next level. We've already talked about how money from these big tournaments funds the game, especially in terms of the support for emerging nations, but how the cake is cut may be about to change. This is what happened in Formula 1 as well. Whilst motor racing's revenue grew and the money paid to race teams increased threefold, it was the distribution of that wealth which was not equal. Gerard Lopez, head of Lotus at the time, there would have been no issue if the money had been shared equally amongst the race teams. So rugby fans should be under no illusion about what to expect if the experience of Formula 1's ownership by CVC is anything to go by. CVC expect a return from investment and they pursued that ruthlessly in Formula 1. They paid approximately $1.4 billion for its majority stake and made up to $3.5 billion over the decade of ownership. In 2014, it's reported they took profit of $347 million from a turnover of $1.25 billion, at that point representing a return on investment of more than 350%. By the time they were out, they'd have taken with them £4.5 billion from the sport, a massive return for their initial stake, and they still maintain a small holding which will continue to pay dividends. All things considered, governing body, the FIA, have had to adapt to their new sporting reality. With less fans, an inflated business model and an investor who is all but left save for a yearly appearance at the AGM, they have to imagine and create alternative codes, like the World Endurance Championship and Formula E, new variations to entice new audiences and sustain the beast that motor racing had become. Herein lies rugby's most important takeaway. We can already see World Rugby trying to simplify the game through law changes, whilst battling safety concerns, especially around head injury in the 15s game. On the side, they're still pushing the World 7 series, whilst trying to introduce a raft of new initiatives. A Nations Championship, a World 12 series, and something called Rugby X, which sounds suspiciously like 7s, but with 10 lads on the pitch instead. The drive to rip up or dilute down what rugby is in the hope of appealing to new markets is shameful. Whoring rugby out instead of investing on or improving the current concept and investing in growing the game in new markets. Chile are a perfect example of how you can grow the game. With them comprehensively beating Canada 33-24, keeping their Rugby World Cup hopes alight for 2023, I for one certainly hope we see Los Condores in the America's 2 spot come autumn 2023. To blow it up for today, let's conclude by saying it's clear why private equity get into sport. They're a great asset class, simple to underwrite, and the cash flows are pretty consistent. You know the money is going to come from a long-term media contract and it'll be significant if you play your cards right. The benefits to rugby for their involvement are clear. Expertise and extra bargaining power with media companies. They may even force the discussion on a global calendar to shore up the latter. All positives for rugby. But to balance the scales, let Formula 1 act as our warning. We cannot be blind to the end game here. Fix it up and ship it off to the next person. We live in hope that when the time comes, rugby's administrators have sufficiently prepared and are better for the relationship. If anything, with ex-premiership boss Darren Childs now at CVC, rugby may have its own Trojan horse waiting to do it as solid when the time comes. But that remains to be seen as well. So that's it for the rep this week and that's it for Christmas. You're getting no more out of me. We'll be back in the new year to look at how the laws of rugby have changed over the years to improve safety but also make rugby a better spectacle for fans. We're going to deep dive some of the key evolutions of the game and even make our own suggestions on how we can improve the game. So until then, why don't you subscribe, tell your mates, and if you're feeling extra charitable this Christmas, give us a rating and a review. All these things help us reach more people and drive the conversation on our favourite game. Thanks a mil to everyone who supported the pod this year. Cannot wait to come back next year. So with that in mind, I'll leave you be. Go have a great Christmas. Watch some of the Interpros if you're in Ireland and enjoy the home derbies elsewhere. Go well. Happy Christmas.